Okay, so welcome to today's YouTube video. If you're an avid runner, you want to get better at running, you want to see your race results improve, this is a video you don't want to miss. We're going to go through my recent fitness test. It's called a lactate threshold step test. And I'm going to go through how perhaps from 2004, when you look back at my results and my threshold pace back then was six minutes per mile, 16 to 16 and a half kilometers an hour. And now it's 20 kilometers an hour. And how do you get there? How do you get from six minute mile pace and it taken the same amount out of your body that now 448 per mile takes out of your body. Today, I don't want to just show you that test. I don't want to just brag about the numbers or say, look at this, look how fast I am. Today is a way to show you this test, show you what it means to do a test like this, how it looks, maybe why you should do it, but also perhaps how those numbers from 2004 have shifted and now they're faster. What kind of things do you do in training to get the numbers faster? How do you know they're getting faster? That's what we're gonna cover today. Hope you enjoy the video, enjoy, thanks for watching. Okay, so like I said, this is an opportunity to go through my most recent fitness test. I've been getting back into training with the goal of qualifying for Paris 2024 Olympics. I've probably been back into full training now around five or six weeks, and it was about time to get in the lab and get some testing done. This testing acts as a base phase or a base mark you could say and it basically puts a line on a piece of paper that says that's where we're at right now. Then what you do and what everybody should be doing is you put a training plan in place to take your numbers or your speeds at certain efforts. Well you want to put a training plan in place that moves those numbers forward. It's that simple. Why I really like numbers and why I like getting back in the lab and doing this kind of testing is because I like to see is all this hard work that I'm putting in, is it paying off? It holds me accountable to the training. It holds coaches accountable to is what you're setting working. If not, why not? Is it my input? Am I not doing the recovery stuff well? Am I not sleeping enough? Is my nutrition not in a good place? Why am I doing this training? Why perhaps have I invested 3,000 pound to go up a mountain, to altitude the train, to put in all this hard work, make this big investment, I came back six weeks later and the numbers are no better. That's why I like working to numbers. You don't have to go into the lab to do this kind of testing. Start to have a think about, could I do some kind of test that's similar to this test? All it is is, three minutes on a treadmill, bit of recovery, three minutes on a treadmill, bit of recovery. You can do similar yourself at home, running at paces that are relevant to your fitness, and you can start to track heart rate, pace, intensity, how did it feel, and over time, track if it's getting better. Over time, it's perhaps very important, two weeks out from a race, to do a little test like this, and perhaps it'll tell you Am I further ahead than a previous test? And perhaps can I then expect a better result? And if I don't get a better result, maybe I need to work on my psychology. Maybe I need to work on my race execution, my discipline in races. These are the kind of questions that you need to start to ask yourself. So today's test, it starts at 17 kilometers an hour and I went all the way to 21 kilometers an hour. I do six minutes at 15 kilometers an hour, and then six minutes at six minutes, sorry, at 16 kilometers an hour, kind of as an extended warm up. So of course I go into Sports Institute Northern Ireland in Belfast, I do my own little 10 to 15 minutes warm up in the little indoor area, then I move to some drills, some dynamic stretching, some dynamic drills, 
and then I move into some strides and then I go back in the lab, I have to do a pee, we have to check my hydration. Hydration can affect your lactate levels. After I do that, you weigh in. Once you've finished your little weigh in, that gets scored down, I was 69.7 kg. Then I'm on the treadmill and I'm, ex I'm doing the rest of my warm up. you could say. I think it was actually five minutes, five minutes at 15 kilometers an hour, straight into five minutes at 16 kilometers an hour and then you're taking a base lactate. The reason you take a base lactate is because you want to know, right at kind of like easy warm up effort, where are the numbers at? If the number's already quite high, perhaps you're tired that day, and so it was super important to know what that rest and value was. If you're doing your own test at home, start to think about where is my heart rate normally after a warm up? Is it a bit higher today? What's going on? Am I tired? Start to think about these things. Then you go straight into my personal test protocol is three minutes at 17 kilometers an hour, 30 seconds rest, three minutes at 17 kilometers an hour, all the way up to 21. The reason I like to do three minutes and three minutes is because sometimes my lactate has this kind of, it might actually a bit, be a bit higher in the first one. I take the 30 seconds rest, I go again, 30 seconds allows the physiologist to take some lactate, start to see where it's at, write some numbers down, where's your heart rate at, where's your lactate at, what was your rate of perceived exertion, how tired are you, how are you finding it. The reason I like to do it again is because we've often find, or sorry, we've often found with my numbers that when I do that second three minutes, my lactate sometimes comes down. And so we do that in a way to make sure that three minutes isn't that much, we paint a bigger picture by doing six minutes. You're in the lab longer, it's hotter, it's harder. I just think it's more relevant to marathon to stretch those efforts out. If you're gonna do 800 meter reps or 1200 meter reps, it's not that relevant to marathon. The marathon's pretty long. And so I keep that recovery short at 30 seconds, just enough time to get the lactate and jump back on. And that means by the time you get to 20 K an hour, 20.5 K an hour, 21 K an hour, you're already pretty tired. And by that point, your body doesn't really know or think that it's just a three minute rep, 30 seconds rest, three minutes. By that point, you've been on a treadmill for 35, 40 minutes and it feels a little bit more relevant to marathon. Okay, 2004, I tested at, I think it was 14 kilometers an hour. I'm gonna put the data on the screen, you'll see it. 14 kilometers an hour for my LT1, which is the basically that first inflation. You've moved from easy, easy, easy to, okay, I'm working a little bit. You've came above what they call like a resting lactate state. Easy pace, easy pace, easy pace. Okay, we're starting to do something. That's kind of LT1. LT2, which is kind of up for interpretation in terms of terminology. People call it threshold, people call it tempo. But that next jump, you could say, and, and when I show you these curves, you're gonna see it. That next jump is a, it's a more prominent jump. And basically beyond that more prominent jump, your curve starts to rise quickly. And so it's kind of that area that just before that area, you're kind of still in control, you're kind of in a good place, but right after that area, it really starts to get a lot tougher quickly. And it goes downhill in terms of, this doesn't feel great. I don't know if I can keep this pace going. And that's like LT2, and that's the terminology I'm gonna to use today. In 2004, my LT2 was 16 and a half kilometers an hour. That's about 550 pace per mile, and that's the first ever threshold test that I'd done. I'll put the numbers on the screen, you get to see them. Now, if you fast forward, oh, let me do some maths, 19 years of training, that's when I've now got to a place where my LT1 is I've just came back five, six weeks of training, so don't read into this too much, but my LT1 sits between 18 to roughly 19 kilometers an hour. So it's moved from 14, four kilometers an hour. That's quite a jump. My LT2 has moved from 16 and a half kilometers an hour to I'm gonna say in this test in particular, it was around 19 and a half to 20 kilometers an hour, but I reckon 
in my bear shape, it's probably been 20.5, 20 to 20.5. And so you're looking at 16.5 to 20.5. That's a fairly even split between LT1 and LT2. Four kilometers an hour, and it only took like 20 years. <laughs> That's a little bit depressing. <laughs> it's not depressing, it takes time. The better you get, the faster you get, of course, the harder it gets to move these fitness curves forward. In the world of cycling, what they do is they take your curve, where your fitness is at, and they map it out and they say, this is the kind of athlete, this is how their profile would, would, would look if they're going to win the Tour de France. So they take your curve, they show it to the guy that's going to win the Tour de France or girl, and they basically say, how can we get you from here to here? And that's when, first of all, you should definitely watch my full day of training video because that's where it's not just about the how to train and go today. It's not just about what training did you do today. In order to maximize, let's say you can move your curve forward by one kilometer an hour per year. In order to achieve that, it's how you do the training. It's also not your best days training, your best weeks training, your best months training. I actually genuinely believe you'd be better taking your best month of training out of the equation completely and just working on your worst months. We all have them, we're all guilty, and I'm gonna to get to that in a second. You'd be better taking your worst months and making them okay months. Get rid of the best one and just have lots more okay months. By the end of that year, if you stick to things like watch my full day of training, how you execute in the training, how's your hydration in the morning, how's your nutrition, do you do any foam rolling, do you have Epsom baths, do you have ice baths, where's your SNC at, do you do rehab to help those muscles that are breaking down, are you helping your body basically extract the most out of the training that you're doing in order to get that 1% or get that one kilometer an hour. 1% in every single area, recovery, nutrition, strength, psychology, helps to move the curve forward. It's not just the training. In terms of the actual training, so as you can see today, 17 kilometers an hour, 18 kilometers an hour, 19, 19 and a half, 20, 20.5, 21, you need to think about roughly where your speeds are at, and of course, as I went up the speeds, you can see that the lactate level started to rise and that heart rate started to rise. Clear as day, very simple to understand. As speed increases, so does effort. Lactate is a measure of fatigue in the muscles. So of course, as that speed increased, more fatigue in the muscles. You're creating that lactate because more fatigue. You're unable to buffer all this lactate's being created and you're not able to buffer it as quickly as you once were when you were more in control you want to attack the entire curve. And I keep talking about curve, and that's your speed for me personally, that's from 17K an hour up to 21, 22K an hour. You want to attack the whole curve. Where it gets complicated is how much time you can spend at each area of the curve without getting injured, without breaking down. You need to start to think about that. You need to start to think about when I'm working, say, this part of my curve or marathon pace or half marathon pace, do I get better? I don't improve as quickly when I'm doing marathony type effort stuff or LT1. It doesn't make it not important. I still do it, but I know that I get a bigger bang for my buck, you could call it, at that kind of LT2 and actually just above it. So based on the recent test, you're talking 19 and a half kilometers an hour up to 21 kilometers an hour. That's an area that when I do work at that level, when I train at that level, very quickly performance jumps happen. I can literally tell you that three weeks ago, I would have done a session just above that LT2 kind of range and probably already within three, four weeks, I'm almost 10 to 15 seconds per mile faster. That doesn't happen forever. Maybe six sessions, eight sessions, and you've already tapped that out. That's why you've got to always be working on the LT1, the stuff below, and some stuff above. So you're constantly, you know when you're making bread and you're flipping it over and you're stretching it out, flipping it over, stretching it out, that's all that support work. So you've got the kind of training that gives you a big bang for your buck, 
but you've also got all the support work to just keep complementing those sessions that help to move you forward. You rest, you recover, you go again, repeat. Let me tell you, getting better at running is really boring. It's boring work, and I mean that. A lot of athletes don't get better because they're not willing to just repeat the same patterns. A lot of athletes don't get better because they're not willing to do the recovery stuff, the nutrition stuff, the psychology stuff. Some athletes don't know what to do. If you don't know what to do, check out the website joggingroom.com, have a look, heaps on there, 60 lectures, 12 hours of tips, it's a master class of all things nutrition, hydration, sleep, everything you could think of linked to nutrition, recovery, strength, psychology, you can check it out. That's the only bit of add in here. If you already know all this stuff, the recovery stuff, the strength stuff, rehab stuff, psychology stuff, race plan, and how to map it all out, you don't even have to look. I really want to educate people to know it's not just the training. I wish it was just the training. If it was just the training, we'd all be brilliant. But if you go through your first cycle, a two-week cycle of training, you work the bottom part of your curve, the middle bit, the top bit, you work the whole curve everything will move forward. The second time you do it, even if you don't do it right, even if you run too hard some days, you don't worry about your nutrition, there's no foam rolling, there's no warm up routine, there's no activation routine, even if you do it that way, you'll still move forward. But the best athletes that extract the most out of their training and get the best results on race day, relevant to their level, they're able to, these cycles, these seven day, 14 day cycles, they're, either to, they're able sorry, to keep those going over probably a six month to 12 month stint and keep getting better, not get injured, not get sick. And that's because they're doing all the support work around the system. You've got your easy running, you've got your steady running, you've got your marathon or steady state type running, you've got your half marathon thresholdy type running, you've got intervals, you've got hills, you've got sprints, that's all fantastic. They're all great ways to attack the curve. All you have to do is Google VO2 max session. It's there, it's on Google, you can find it. That's not the hard part. The hard part is doing it right, not doing it too hard, and being willing to realize that that one session you did, that's not gonna cut it. You have to repeat that for six months, 12 months. What am I on, year 19? repeating the same patterns. In 2018, my results were the exact same as they were the other day. That's five years. Five years and I had the exact same fitness profile five years ago. What's went wrong? Psychology. Psychology is huge. I can't handle how boring running is sometimes. I have ADHD. I crave dopamine, I wanna change the plan all the time, I wanna add in these exciting race goals that don't make any sense, but I just throw them in there. I find something that works, but I get bored of it, so I rip it up and I throw it in the bin. Psychology. You have to start looking at, were you better a couple of years ago? Are you not doing things right? Are you getting bored of the training? You have to deal with it. I'm bored of training. My fitness test was pretty good. I already want to rush into marathon training. I had this big master plan. Race some 10Ks, race a half marathon in probably August, race Berlin Marathon, qualify for the Olympics. This entire comeback was to qualify for the Olympics. I do one fitness test, it goes okay, pretty good for me, and suddenly I want to race. I could do a marathon in eight or 10 weeks time. That's the brain, it's not logic. You must follow logic. <laughs> I'm gonna sound like a broken record, but honestly, in the Jogner Masterclass, there's 15 lectures on psychology. It is the biggest and most important part to start getting on top of. Dopamine, changing plans, no discipline in training, no discipline in races, can't follow a race plan, how to set up a race plan, how to have mantras how to just enjoy life a bit better, how to go a bit easier on yourself, how to stop beating yourself up. I don't wanna go off topic. If you struggle psychologically, 
have a look. There's some free lectures. In fact, if you struggle psychologically, meditate, journal, go for walks without your phone, plan time into your day to calm things down, but don't change the training. Set a plan and stick to it. Your plan was probably really good. Basically, you attack all the areas of the curve, you do as much as you possibly can around the training for recovery, get your psychology in a good place, get your SNC going, doesn't matter if you don't have heaps of time, do some at home, strengthen the areas of your body that are breaking down, and over time, your fitness will improve. Each year, if you did a test at the start of the year and the end of the year, and there's a 100% improvement, you're accountable to how much that year of that improvement you call it collect versus neglect. If you do things right, if you stick to plans, if you don't miss training, if you don't fall off this kind of consistency side of things because your motivation goes up and down, maybe you're not looking after your psychology, maybe you're making bad choices, you're in control of that progression. In 2018, I had the exact same test as I have right now. That means my potential in 2018 was as good as it is right now. That's five years. I haven't wasted those five years because there's been massive peaks, 209, 6108. But my problem is I could take away some of those best months and I could replace probably three to four months of the year with just better training. I want to help people. I built this masterclass, this running school, this YouTube channel to help people not fuck it up like I kept doing. I literally retired 10 weeks before I ran 209. I made this big announcement. I went out and got hammered drunk. I hadn't trained for two months. I was biking and drinking red wine over lockdown. I've struggled. But I know that I could take away some of those peaks and just replace them with just simple and boring and basic training. What sometimes you need to do is not get excited by changing the plan, changing the session. You need to get excited by, am I working on my pre-bed routine? Am I journaling? Am I meditating? Am I looking after the recovery stuff, my nutrition, my hydration? Get excited about those things. Plan those things. Don't just wing those things. Start to include that stuff in your training. I've chatted a lot. If I'm gonna give a tip on what's the best type of training to do, it's threshold all day long. That kind of like three to four word answer area, but don't neglect the effort above it. I went the other day, I was in Turkey, I did my easier threshold session, there's a YouTube video about it, but I had to go out two days later. Believe me, I wanted to just do threshold again. Threshold gets comfortable. Threshold gets a bit easier. I then had to work that area just above threshold, probably like 10K to 10 mile type effort. It's harder. <laughs> if you neglect it, if you don't work that area, very soon you do improve your threshold, but your threshold and 10K and 5K, they start to get really close together. If you keep working the 10K and the 5K stuff, you keep that gap better. You improve threshold, but 10K can push along as well. You improve that threshold, 5K can push along as well. If you neglect those areas, it all just gets really close together. In terms of the fitness curve, it'll go like this. It'll stay good, it'll stay good because you've worked on it, and then it'll just ramp up really quickly. If you work those areas above threshold as well, you'll keep that curve flatter for longer, and then in that 5K, 10K, 3K range, you're in a better place. Work the entire curve is my advice. Work on that consistency, figure out things that's gonna help your consistency, recovery, sleep, nutrition, I've told you that, and enjoy it. This is hard. I have beat myself up for years and years of my life trying to figure out running. It's not that complicated. We complicate it, every time, no doubt about it. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you enjoyed that experience of me doing the fitness test. I was actually really happy with the results for now but I'm very excited to stick to a very boring and very basic plan, but just not change it. Stick to it, trust it, and watch me in September go to Berlin and run 208.10 for the marathon and qualify for the Paris Olympics. Does that sound boring? Not one bit. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed that. 
give me some love, like, subscribe, and take care. Enjoy your running and stop beating yourself up for God's sake. Be a bit nicer to yourself. Say well done. Well done for getting all the way through this video. And if you want to check out joggingroom.com, you can. Just for once a build up to just be clean because I don't do stupid things and the silly mistakes I keep making. And then that'll produce a result that I'll finish and I'll go, yeah, that was the one. There wasn't like a, I ran to a nine, but when I ran to a nine, I knew I was still tired from a half marathon I did three weeks before that was never in the plan. So had I not done the half marathon, I might've ran two away already. Or if it wasn't 15 mile per hour winds and sleet and snow. Um, yeah, sticking to a plan, following through with the build up and seeing a result that is a fair reflection of my ability without me holding myself back. I coach maybe like 10 athletes uh -huh. and I realized that I set them all this training, but I never actually like, I don't really ever give them anything around that. And that's kind of the whole problem with like online training plans. The core principles of the school is to teach people everything that I do is autopilot that they won't know about. Showing people by video, warm up drills, pre run activation, strength conditioning, everything, technique drills, all sorts. We'll have recovery, nutrition, strength conditioning, psychology, and then we'll get to the very running specific how to run, how to train the right way how to execute training in the right way, how to set goals, how to work on your technique, all sorts. But it will be like, yeah, I'm pretty, uh, I'm pretty excited about it. I think it's gonna help people a lot. See, like, I did a podcast a week ago and I've been told four years later, it's the best one yet. And that's probably because it centers around mental health and honesty and but it's all connected. Share in it. It's only until you start doing it and helping people that you're like, wow, this is a bit bigger than even I am.